Good morning, and welcome to First Christian Church of Lansing, Michigan. We are so glad you're here with us, wherever you are, in whatever capacity you're joining us this morning. Um, just a few simple things I want to let you know about. Uh, if you have any prayer requests today, please go ahead and submit those in the Facebook chat, or you can uh, text the office. Um, or there is a, if you're one of the few people there in the church, there is a plate in the entryway outside of the narthex that you can put those in. Um, please send us your prayer requests. We would love to be a light in whatever moment you need us. And those who are at home now, I'd like to invite you to please joyously join us as we listen to the praise band uh, sing Your Grace is Enough. don't even have words. I love it. All right. Uh, so our call to worship this morning is adapted from Psalm 19, 7 through 10. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. Let us worship God. 
And now for children's moment, I'm going to bring in some crazies. Come. Alexis and Lou. Um, yeah, Lou, you have to exist. There we go. Okay. So I want to talk to you guys about a couple of words. I want you to tell me if you know what they mean. Okay. So have you heard the word covenant? No. Speak so people can hear you. Yes. yes you've heard no. Of yeah. Okay. And have you heard the word contract? Yes. Okay. Could, do you think you could explain to me what covenant or contract mean? No. Okay. So let me help you out here. So a contract. I have a piece of paper here. It's hard to read, but it says that we'll have a contract. This is a silly one, just for example. But I will not call you by your name for two whole days. So I can call you nicknames or silly things, but I won't call you Alexis or you Lou for two whole days. And we can make a contract on that. Like you can and, call me dad. Okay, I'll call you dad, whatever. And in the contract, you would get something from me. So if I do that, then you can have all the candy that's left over from Halloween all at once. How's that? Yeah, that's yummy. All right, I'll add that to our contract here. Okay, if you agree with contract, then you just write your name here. So scribble your name there real quick. How do I you think? don't know how to spell your name? Just No, how do I scribble my name? It's a pretend contract, just scribble. Thank you. Okay, will you sign your name on this line, Lou? And then once the contract signed, we'll start. Okay, so for two whole days, I'm not going to call you Alexis or you Lou. Oh. I just broke our contract. Oh, well. That's that. We'll just go about our normal business. But that's what a contract is. A contract is just two people agreeing to some things. They sign on it. And then if it breaks, like ours just did, because I messed it up, then they rip up the contract and they just go on about their business. That's all they do. That's a contract, right? Here's the tricky part or not tricky but different god has a covenant with us that was that other word i said do you have any ideas what a covenant might be it's kind of similar but it's more special it's even more important um. okay that's okay so a covenant is different from a contract because if we break it mm -hmm. We get another chance. God has covenants with us. And they say many things about how God will protect us. And like the rainbow is a covenant of God. And the rainbow is God's promise to not flood us again. And that's a covenant. It's a, it's a promise. It's a thing. Now, if we get really bad rain and we get a flood, are we like, oh, God messed up. We're just going to rip up that contract and we're going to go to separate ways. No more God for us. No more us for God. No. Exactly. Because God is for us to live. God is for us to live. God is for us forever. No matter if we mess up or, you know, if God messes up, right? No matter how it messes up. So when you make a bad choice, are you breaking the covenant of God? When God says to do good things, not harm other people. No, you're not breaking it. It can't be broken. You can mess it up. You can have an oops. But God says, I will still be there for you. I'm not going to rip this up and move on. Cool? Mm -hmm. Do I get a high five for that? Awesome. Thanks, kiddos. And so uh, now I'll pass it over to Jerry for our stewardship moment. Hi. Uh, well, there I am. Hi, this is Jerry Sachs. And I really am happy that we're able to, to talk about covenant between us and God and God's contract with us. 
for me, I was told many, many years ago that God loves me, that I was given a gift and the gift is a gift of joy on a daily basis. And that that is what God gave me was a gift. And it's because of his mercy, because of his love, and especially because of his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy of it. I don't measure up to it. I can't work for it. But God gave me that gift simply because he loved me. That's why he sent his son. You know, this is about mercy. This is about love. And you know, we, we come here to, to give our gifts before God because of his love, because of the gift. And because of, because of him, that's why we live. That's why we have the opportunity to have that covenant. And yes, we do make mistakes. Yes, we aren't necessarily always worthy of God's love. But because of Jesus, we do measure up. We, we are open. Uh, as we bring our gifts today, we remember that it is because of his love and his mercy that we are here and that we can live our life knowing that God loves us. Thank you, Father. Amen, Jerry. And if you're at home and you want to give to First Christian Church, uh, there is a link right on our website where you can go and donate online. Uh, or you can also send to the church. Uh, you can contact us by Facebook if you have other means that you'd want to reach out, uh, as well as if you're one of those scattered few in the church, there is a plate outside. And now let me share with you our scripture reading for today. It comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And I think this may be familiar to you. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were no, of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses their name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Eli. That is a fantastic reading this morning. And you know, your children's moment really connected with what I'm doing today. Uh, my sermon title today is Of Contracts and Covenants. And it deals with the scripture you just read. But before we unpack everything this Sunday, let us join together and let us pray to God as one. Lord of overturning your passion sweep away the calculating religion 
and the pious profiteering which keeps us safely outside the holy places. May we find our way through the debris of all that's protected us from finding your dangerous heart and our world upside down. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts as one be acceptable in your sight, for we ask it through Jesus Christ, our exiled Lord. Amen. Good morning, all! Good morning! Now let's have it one more time for you at home. Good morning, all! Good morning! Good morning! All right. Time to celebrate. Time to for joy. Time to let loose. Am I right? Amen. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. These times of Lent can really be a drag. All right? Not so much joy. The mood is more somber and the music sometimes, and not always, but sometimes is in a minor key. Yes, we as church, we as church have long ago left behind the lights of Christmas and Epiphany, all the decorations in exchange for what? This. This. Somber purple. Repentant purple. So what do we do on this week, this third Sunday of Lent, when we're supposed to be celebrating the not, not, not being one uh, to be somber? What do we do? We ended up reading the uh, Exodus version of the Ten Commandments. Can we have an old boy? Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> now let's be honest. Our first response might be this. Now, think about this a little bit, because this might be just in your heart, but you're not saying it. Yes, Lord, we've been in the midst of Lent for three weeks now. Yes, we have well aware that we've broken your laws and stayed from your ways like lost sheep. Ugh. God, can you get us some slack this day? Am I right? Am I right about this? We want to celebrate, right? I mean, we want to celebrate God's love. We want to celebrate God's grace. We want to celebrate that healing that God gives to us today. That's what this Sunday is about. That's what every Sunday of Lent is about, to celebrate. But I'd like to start today with a pop quiz. That is, this Sunday with a pop quiz. A uh, bit of a pop quiz, it is. And... Um, I know that none of us really like pop quizzes and we ain't going, oh, right. But um, let's start with a pop quiz. Perhaps we, we maybe lighten it up a little bit. Let's, let's call it a morale or morality check. So in reading today's scripture that Eli did such a beautiful job of, we have a list of moral decrees. We have those things we do to God and those things we do to others. Now think back, think back over the last week. No more, Let's, last year. Even more than that, let's go back to your childhood. Let's go back to your entire life. Give you a second here to think about that. And if you fail at anything, maintaining these commandments, you kind of get a wow, right? I mean, wow. So how do we, how do you do, or how do we do, um, in this, how did we do in this? How did we make this happen or not? Well, let's be honest, let's be honest. Most of us were likely did okay. I mean, uh, how many of us would covet an ox? I mean, have you seen an ox lately? I haven't seen an ox lately, but we haven't coveted an ox. And, or we're not murdering anybody, are we? I mean, we might have thought about it in our hearts a little bit, but we haven't murdered anybody, am I right? But, but this Sunday, if you've ever missed a putt for you golfers, or if for you fishermen, if you've ever been fishing and hung up your jig on a rock and lost it, or for those who drive on a regular basis in this community and you've ever been in a, a, a tra traffic jam, or if you've had somebody cut you off 
uh, without signaling or even thinking about it and driving 20 to 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. Or perhaps you can add something else to it. We've probably used the God's name in vain, haven't we? At least once, right? I mean, we gotta be honest, we've at least used once. Or how about working on the Sabbath? Hmm? How many of us can honestly say we've never done anything on the Sabbath? I mean, <laughs> this is funny because I had one person say to me, well, pastor, you know, it's, you know, mowing's not working on the Sabbath. Well, yeah, it is. Truthfully, the Sabbath is to be kept holy and it's supposed to be kept to unto itself. Or how about coveting? Coveting your neighbor's new BMW or Porsche or Jag or, or Cadillac or Audi or that massive SUV or that big truck, four by four? Or how about those neighbor's techno gadgets, the technology that we all love, the big screen TVs, the computers that do almost everything today. All these, all these are practically a way of life these days. We covet them. We want them. We see them. Am I right? We want these things, all of us. So we all perhaps fail daily to keep these moral directives of the Ten Commandments. However, in truth, in truth, and this is the great thing, in truth, we are destined to fail. It's inevitable. It's part of the human fabric. Why? Because we're like children. Now, for you who are parents out there, you know what I'm talking about. We're like children. Yet God, God does something. God promises us to provide for us and to be Lord and Savior for us for all time. All time. No exceptions. So what does he ask in return? What does he ask? He just asks these 10 rules to be followed. You might call it like parental rules or like house rules. I think house rules is a good way of looking at it. But you know, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters recognize an additional 603, they call them mitzvah, we call them commandments that are found in the book of Moses. Which if you add it together, 613, wow, right? I mean, 613 things to follow. That is things God asks us to do or not to do. And you know, let's be honest, we, we most likely fail all of them, although we probably don't know all of them ourselves. Yet in all this, God is always faithful, even though we are what we would call serial defaulters. We, we just don't live up to it. So what does God do about our inabilities? I mean, that's a good question to ask today. What does God do about our inabilities to keep up with this contract that he put forth in the book of Exodus? The answer is this. And I think this is a great thing. God didn't make a contract. God didn't make a contract. God made a covenant, which is truly different from a contract. And Eli, thank you for putting that out there. It is a lot different than a contract. And thank God it is. I mean, for us today in this world that we live in, contracts, contracts are formalized agreements based on an agreement, a mutual agreement between each other, right? Uh, they work quite like real when we hire somebody in, in employment situations or business transactions. We love that. It keeps us focused. Each person or partner in this contract gives each other the necessary things it needs. And in the end, the mutual goal that is in the contract is achieved. But the primary beneficiary in all this, no matter what it is, is me. Can we say me? Always me. It's about getting it out, what you put into it, and hopefully more. It's about that, that, getting that much more out of it. So what if the counterpart, like Eli did, falters and defaults? Well, the contract can be canceled. It can be broken. Think about this a minute. It can be broken. Yet, if this was God, if this is the case with God, 
the lawyers, most likely angels, would have been calling on us centuries ago, knocking on our doors, saying, you broke the contract. And God would have moved to the next planet partner or partner planet, if you will. And we'd have to figure out our own bankruptcy, our own bankruptcy plan and more uh, make amends for the failure of our obligations. We'd have to figure out something out. But from the beginning, now think about this, from the beginning, God's agreement, God's business plan with us, if you want to put it in today's language, has been rooted not in a contract, but in a covenant. Praise God, good news, we are in a covenant. Moses put it this way in Deuteronomy. It is not with our ancestors that the Lord made his covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. And I want to say that extends clear to the present time. And he goes on to say this. He says, know therefore the Lord your God is God. And I'm going to say parent. God is our parent. God is the faithful God keeping God's covenant of love to all thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 7, 9. So what does God expect? Well, God expects us to love and obey like a parent. When we tell our children to do something, we expect them to love and obey. We can kind of relate with that. To advance God's will in this is what God wants and to care for each other to bring love and well-being to all and all of God's creation. And I mean all of God's creation. <coughs> and God puts it this way. I love how he, God puts this. This is also out of Deuteronomy in the sixth chapter. He says, listen, Israel. Now, he, he, let's put it this way. We might say, listen, all people, the United States, wherever. Our God is the Lord. The Lord, only the Lord. And in other words, God's saying, there isn't anybody else. This is me, bottom line. And he says this, he says, Lord, love the Lord your God with you, all your heart, all your being, and all your strength. These words that I am commanding you today must always be on your minds. We're to love him regardless, no matter what. We are to be always in love with God and follow God's rules, if you want to call him that. But he goes on to say something else in Leviticus. He says this, you must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, your God, Leviticus 19, 18. And guess what? We hear something that I think is even better. I think Jesus put it even better when he was uh, in Matthew's gospel, when he was pressured by the scribe to ask what the question of what are the two greatest commandments, that is, two covenants that we have with God. What are those things that are above everything else? And Jesus said this out of Matthew, you must love your God with all your heart and all your being, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, you must love your God as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend upon these two commandments. This is the covenant that God has passed. And Jesus put it rightly. Yet in this, yet in this, as children, we, as children, we oftentimes fail to do this. Our mistakes and inabilities do not affect, however, what God has placed before us. Our God's commitment to us, that is the good news of this time. God's commitment to us is that he still cares for us. He's still going to take care of us. He's, he is what we look to, and, he, and we call it grace today. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that if you read the Bible, the biblical writers employ economic and judicial and contractual language, if you will, to explain our relationship with God. Those are partial metaphors, if you will, partial, only partial metaphors. And it's an attempt to explain the illogical nature of the covenant God makes with us. I mean, the covenant doesn't make sense, at least not in our minds. I mean, contracts we understand, covenants we don't. 
I mean, contracts are governed by rules and bargaining, right? Covenants, on the other hand, covenants are governed by the irrational, the irrational but eternal rules of love. And I'm going to say agape love, that love that knows no bounds, that doesn't expect anything back, that love which only comes from God. I mean, remember, remember the covenant with Noah we looked at a few weeks ago. He plays to rainbow in the sky. After the great flood, he was sorry that he destroyed everything and everybody except for those that were on the ark. In that God, with no prompting from any human, any kind of all trying to make a contract with God not to do this again, declared what well, we heard then, as for me, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you. You put a time limit on it. This is eternal. Thousands upon thousands of years, whatever it is. God, God truly has chosen to make a covenant with us, with earth as well and all of creation. And I wanna stress all of creation. In this, we don't have to do anything. There's no response, no bargaining on our part that's required. And I wanna repeat that. In this, no response, no bargaining on our part is required. It's not. A covenant, God's covenant that he made is a deep soul level connection that binds one to another. In other words, binds us, all of creation to God. And you know what's really great? God has really decided he wanted to be bounded with, bound with us. And that's great news. That is really the great news of today. So the great news is what I call joy to celebrate this Saturday and Sundays together. Oh, to be clear now, God made these covenants full understanding, kind of like parents and appreciating our strengths and our talents and our, of our faith. I mean, he's, God is, is, is one of those things where he, like a parent, looks down and, or to us and knows we are like children. Yet more like a parent, like us, or not, an aunt, uncle, whatever, with a full understanding uh, and appreciation, that is, of our imperfections and failings and our inabilities that we're gonna do our best, but we're given to fail. We're gonna always do our best. And God knew what God was getting into. God knew what God was getting into. Yes, the way a wise parent knows what's in store, what's in store when we or they raise their children. That no matter, no matter, and I want to make this point, that no matter how many times a rule, a commandment is given or explained, failure is inevitable. Now, that sounds pretty harsh, but not really, not always. More, God understood the imperfection was to be understood, but love, agape, love, and grace was to endure forever. You know, when I was looking at this, I looked at uh, Paul's writing, and I love the Ephesians, uh, letter to the Ephesians, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about this next week, but in the second chapter, the fifth verse, I think Paul puts it so well. I think it kind of ties this whole thing together. When Paul gives the light into this this love, this love that God gives. Um, he says this, however, God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. Something we don't always understand. God brought us to life with Christ. While we were dead in our, as a result of our, those things that we did wrong. 
In other words, he understands that we, we don't always follow the rules. God did this because of the great love that God has for us. You are saved by God's grace. God's covenant. It reminded me of a, an old Jewish proverb to this Sunday as I was thinking about this. And this old Jewish proverb goes this way. It says that when God decided to create the world and God foresaw all the sin that uh, humans would commit against God and each other, the only way God could continue in this creation was to decide to forgive the world before God created it. Think about that little proverb. Our brothers and sisters in the Abrahamic tradition sometimes have a lot of truth in what they're talking about. Because God did decide to forgive the world before he created it. So may this love, this love we've been talking about and the grace of forgiveness direct us. And may we give it fully and freely to all of creation, all of creation, not just each other, but all of creation. That God's love may abound be eternal, be always with us. You know, and this is the good news. This is the good news of God. And let's celebrate this Sunday like every Sunday of Lent. Let us celebrate and always celebrate. For we are all forgiven, even though we stumble our toes every once in a while. May it be so. Will you join me in prayer? Most gracious God, as we've come this day, we realize that, boy, we sure try to make everything right in the world. But boy, we do stumble and we do fall. We trip our toes on many things and we look at each other's neighbors and, and we say, boy, I wish we had what they have. We call it keeping up with the Joneses, Lord, but you know, really that's not essential. For you've told us that what we need will be provided. Not what we want, but what we need will be provided always. For those who love their God, so God, understand we love you, we care for you, and we'll do our best to follow you. But we give thanks that in all this, we know that you will forgive us when we stub our toes, and when we don't do what's exactly right. And this is what we celebrate in this Lent, because we know during the week we must look at ourselves and try to repent, or in other words, turn around and do things differently. But on Sundays, we celebrate the fact that you understand that your covenant is to a thousand generations and more. And for this, Lord, we give thanks. Amen. We continue our time of services in an invitation of, of uh, faith this day. And it is interesting that we do this today because this invitation is to be one with God to be one in the covenant with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I realize that today we're, we're doing everything virtually as we have for the last so many Sundays. But that being said, I want you to pray to God today and to accept Jesus into your life. God hears this and will put things under his feet. Those things you've done wrong will be forgiven. <clears throat> Those things that you think about will be forgiven through his son. When the time comes, I would invite you to find that church which is a blessing to you and make that full confession with the church and become part of that body of Christ in that place. Hopefully you'll join us here at First Christian Church because we duly open our doors to all people and hear all voices and try to be one with everyone, no matter what your background. That being said, let us take that time that we might want to lift that prayer and let us listen to Kate today. And I said Kate, as she not only plays, but sings softly and tenderly. <laughs> Thank you. 
come to a time of prayer for not only the church family, but also for the world we live in. In this time when so much is going on, we have to remember that the covenant that God has listed here is not only for us, but also for all of creation. That being said, this day, would you join me in a moment of quiet and prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and wondrous God, as we gather as one this day, you gave us your law on Mount Sinai. We realize this. We've heard it and we cringed and we've tried to follow it in our own ways, like children lost in so many ways. Yes, you know that as a creation people, we have failed to completely keep your law. Yet our knowledge of it strangely gives us comfort each day of our lives. Your prayers, your guidance give us lives that are structured and strengthened. So as we continue our Lenten journey not only on this Sunday, but also this week. Walking, turning your faces towards Jerusalem with Jesus, we ask again for your guidance and your ear. Your ear to hear our prayers. Yes, help us to know that in this time of prayer, your presence, your comfort, and your truth is always with us. So now hear our prayers as we draw out near to you, Lord. The first prayer we lift up this day, O oh Lord, is one for Donald Williams. And two things. We want to give praise to God because of the good surgery he had on his hip, but also we want to pray for continued peace and healing. 
for him and his family. We continue to pray for Lori in her heart surgery that will be done on the 8th. We also look to a, a, a friend of ours who joins us each week on line, Allison Kenny Bieber, Bieber, excuse me, Bieber, who continues to have problems with dizziness and also with arthritis and who is going to have uh, a time with the doctors again Monday to do further tests and hopefully receive some medication will bring relief to her and so that she can see to her 11 month old little girl. We also have prayer requests from Donald and Vaughn, prayers for the twin granddaughters and grandson and the special prayer for uh, Corey, Corinne in this time that you might extend your love and your healing and your care for all of them as you always do, perhaps with an extra measure. But in all this, we also pray for our world, dear Lord, as we continue to battle the COVID-19 virus and pray for those who have already received the vaccine, but have had reactions. We pray for those who have not received the vaccine, but do so want it so desperately, that the world will be cleansed of this virus and that we, can go back to what might be normal, but a new normal. We pray for all those who have suffered during this time, both financially as well as physically. We pray for those who've lost over 500,000 of loved ones this day. We also pray for the world that it might be a better place to live in, that we'll be conscious of the creation that you've given us and that we will be good stewards of it both of the animals that you place before us, as we call them, but also of the resources that you've given us, knowing that they're not endless and that even with promises of, of new ventures into space, it is not a solution for those here on earth. We also ask for guidance for all who are in leadership of this, the nations of this world, that your love might guide them and their words and their actions. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, to whom be the glory forever, who taught his disciples and us to pray. And please join me in this. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into a time of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, as we prepare for the time of table, as we prepare for that time of being one with God, remembering and revitalizing ourselves, with God's bread and cup, let's again open our hearts and minds and hear Kate's beautiful words as she sings to us, bread of the world, mercy broken. always beautiful. So as we join together around God's table today to remember his son, the words from 1 Corinthians 
came to me. It's part of the reading for this week. It's in the first chapter, starting in the 18th verse. And the Apostle Paul talks and writes about the cross. He says this about it, that the cross being foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us, you and me, all of us, who are being saved is the power of God. Kind of interesting that the emblem that's behind me would be the power of God. But yet it is. So we come to the table this day. We come as people who recognize that without the cross, this table, this table would have absolutely no meaning. Truly we recognize and remember what the mighty acts of God has done for us through the life of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection to save the world from sin. As we come this day, let us remember then the wisdom of God and God's unique understanding of folly, the folly of humanity and the covenant which God has made with us. Come this day to God's table through Jesus Christ and know that God is good and be renewed with God's spirit. For we remember each Sunday as we come, the words of Paul, as he wrote to the church in Corinth. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a common loaf of bread made with common hands but then he lifted it to God and he broke it and he gave it to each and every disciple saying, take, eat, for this is my body, which is given for you. They didn't understand that at the time, but he went further and he poured wine into the cup. After doing so, again, he raised it and blessed it. And he gave it to every disciple saying, take, drink of it, all of you. For within it, you will find the new covenant, which is found in my blood for the remission of many sins. A blessing indeed. But then he went further. He reminded them that every time they took of the bread and drank of the cup, they proclaimed his death until he came again. That glorious return promised so long ago. So come. Heavenly Father, although separated by distance, we come together today as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the extraordinary sacrifice you made in sending Jesus, your beloved son, to be with us. We thank you for his legacy in words, action, and obedience to suffering on the cross. Lord, we come to you now to ask for forgiveness for any thoughts, words, or deeds that have not honored your name. We are also truly sorry for the times we have chosen to live selfishly rather than heed your calling. We invite you to inhabit our hearts now as we take communion. As we share this meal, come bind us together as one family filled with your love. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that is at work in our lives. Amen. Amen.
so we prepare to leave this day, to go out in God's creation, to share God's covenant of love and grace, please receive the benediction. Now may God, may God, your source of peace, power, and joy be with you all the days of your life. And may you share it with all, all, always. Now let us hear and sing together as we hear our closing hymn this day, I Will Boast, done by our unbelievably fabulous praise band. Three, four, one, two, three.